I need to focus now on God's Word, I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. And we're going to consider today a big chunk of Scripture which I will have to move through fairly quickly. And there's going to be a PowerPoint of just some very basic points along the way to assist you in keeping up with the flow of the moving text. And I've titled it Heart, Sin and Faith. Heart, Sin and Faith. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, by the time we come to, well, all of chapter 7 really, Jesus has been ministering in the area of Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee, for about 12 months by the time we get to where we are in our text. And in spite of the large, huge crowds of people following him and, and crowding him, in spite of the the mass healings of thousands of people and the demon deliverance of thousands of people. Generally speaking, the majority of the population, the majority of the people who came and got healing by Jesus still rejected Jesus as Lord and Saviour. They still rejected that Jesus was the Son of God and they rejected that He was the Christ and they rejected that He was bringing with Him the Kingdom of God. Oh, but they wanted the healings. You see the point? And this is going to be, we'll see that stretched out as we go through our text. So we pick up our story today in verse 8, following on where Dennis left us last week. And we, Dennis left us last week at the land of uh, Gesenaret, which is on the, I better get my mirror image going for your sake, on the northwestern part of the Sea of Galilee. And I think the last verse, well, no, it wasn't. The first verse that Dennis dealt with last week tells us something quite significant that it introduces our text to us today. Verse 1 of chapter 7, just look at it. The Pharisees suddenly appear on the scene, the religious leaders. Now, the Pharisees there are the local Jewish rulers from that area, from Gesenaret. And they gathered to Jesus, to him, with some of the scribes. Who were these scribes? The text tells you. Who had come up from Jerusalem. Oh, well, hello. Jerusalem was 150 kilometers away. Now, be it by foot power or donkey power or camel power, that is a, a significant journey for these scribes to make. Why is it important to pick up on this? Because the scribes were the lawyers. The scribes were those men who were the legal and religious lawyers of the time. The Pharisees had said to these lawyers, you need to get up here, we've got to sort out this guy, Jesus. And that's the scene that is set. Now there's three things you want to remember. Let's see if I can get my... Um... Ooh. Oh. Three things to remember. Excuse me, I'll get the technology right. Now, if you can plant these three things in your head, this will help you to understand the context of all the verses that are about to follow. First is the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious leaders, Jewish leaders, hated Jesus and they wanted to kill him. We've seen that repeatedly. We see it in, from right from Mark chapter 3. Uh, again, and we see it in Matthew 12. They just wanted to kill Jesus. And in Mark 3 verse 6, we even saw that the political uh, zealots of the time called the Herodians, even the political, political group, wanted to kill Jesus also. But added to that, um, Luke tells us in Luke 13 verse 31 that King Herod also wanted to kill Jesus. So, you see, we have this big romantic picture in our minds that Jesus was Mr. Popular. No, he wasn't. All the authorities wanted to kill him. Make no mistake. Those who hated him the most were the religious leaders. They wanted him gone at any expense. And that's significant because of what's about to follow. Secondly, we need to remember that Jews hated Gentiles. Gentiles being anyone who was a non-Jewish person. Well, that's us. Jews hated Gentiles, period. Thirdly, Jesus' public ministry 
was not what we think it might have been. You see, when we think of Jesus' public ministry, we automatically flick over, he's a miracle worker. But that's not what Jesus said his ministry was. In Mark chapter 1, we read in verses 14 to 15, Jesus came proclaiming the gospel of God, saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Jesus' public ministry was primarily the proclamation of the gospel and calling the population to repentance. Miracles served as nothing more than the authenticating sign that gave evidence that he was the God-man he claimed to be. But his sole primary purpose was to take the gospel and to call people to repentance and faith in him as the saviour. Now, with that in mind, I want to read to you just that first section of verses in our passage from verse 8 through to verse 13. Read along with me. Verse 8, and Jesus says, speaking to um, the scribes and the Pharisees, you leave the commandment of God and hold on to the tradition of men. That's what Dennis taught us on last week so well. Verse 9, and Jesus said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honour your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything to his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. We will stop there for a moment. You know, today we're not that different to first century people. We think we're clever because we've got technology. We think we're sophisticated, but it turns out the hard issues in people today, of us all today, are very much the same hard issues that existed back then. One of the biggest challenges that religious people, Christian people today, f fight is this irritation. They want to do what we want to do. Have you ever noticed that within your own heart? You want what you want. And so we build up Traditions, we build up patterns of doing things. We build up root Christian routines. These religious leaders had built up strong traditions to accomplish what they wanted. But it fought against the Bible. It fought against God's law. And so in, in typical Jesus style, he confronts the superficial nature of the Pharisees' error of teaching about tradition and God's word. So, Mark 7 verse 9, did you notice there? Jesus says to them, you have a fine way of rejecting God's command. Can you just sense the sarcasm dripping from his lips? He's eyeballing these religious leaders they're in a large crowd of people. <laughs> You've got a fine way of fighting God, haven't you? You've created this, just this finely tuned mechanism of using your religion to justify your rules and regulations so that you look good and God's word is made out to be ineffective, void of no value at all, but you promote your traditions. <sighs> Jesus nailed them. He absolutely had them, and we'll see why in a moment. And it all comes down to Jesus is going to expose their hypocrisy through their treatment of their parents. Now remember, God had commanded everyone from Exodus 20, Exodus chapter 21, and Deuteronomy 5 that every human being must honour their parents. Those of us that are parents, we say, thank you, God. Those of us that are children go, hmm, i got to work at this. But it is the command of God for every human being. It is so important to God that he spoke through Peter and said, this is the only commandment that has a promise of long life. Obey your parents and God will prolong your life. That's how significant it is to God. 
But the Pharisees and the scribes gave approval to people who did not honour their parents. And it worked like this. People who did not want to financially take care of their parents in their old age would use the excuse that they had dedicated all their money to God. Ha ha! You see, you can see the building, it's starting. <laughs> so if they dedicated all their money to God, it was free for them to use their money how they wanted for self because there was none, nothing left over for mum and dad. Cunning, eh? That's shrewd. And the Pharisees and scribes, they, they accepted this, and they promoted it. So they taught that, in effect, in practice, your tradition of what you do with your money is of greater value than your parents'. What you do with your money is of greater value than the commandment of God in the Old Testament said you must provide for the needs of your parents in their old age. We can see this in today's society so well, can't we? It is tragic when you go into a lot of these old folks' homes and you see how families neglect their parents in their old age. Absolutely tragic. Joe and I really had our eyes open this because, as you know, my mother spent the last 18 months of her life in a hospital bed in a home. And it was amazing the number of people in there in a terrible state of health and their families never visited them. They never provided financially for them. They were just left for the government to take care of. So the, the issue is still the same today. So, in doing this, the Pharisees made void the word of God. In other words, they made the word of God, the commandment of God, to honour your parents of no importance, no significance, and they justified rejecting the word of God and replacing it with the tradition. And so people would come to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees would say, well, you know, you don't have to spend all this money looking after your parents. All you've got to do is tell your parents that you've committed all your money to God and there's just nothing left over for, you, for, for them. And you can use your God-committed money for yourself and that's just fine. Now that was very convenient, don't you think? But that was what the Pharisees taught. And that's why Jesus confronted them with them. So Jesus, in other words, says to them, you make God's word of just no importance, no value, and no meaning. You replace God's word with your tradition. Can you imagine him being in that crowd? That was a big accusation to make against the religious leaders, publicly. Everyone in that crowd would have known that Jesus had exposed them. They were now on the spot. They brought the, the lawyers in to try and find a fault with Jesus and Jesus put them both up on public display and said, look at everyone, look at their hypocrisy. Well, Proverbs 28 verse 24 says, whoever robs his father or his mother and says, that is no transgression, is a companion to a man that destroys, that is the man who murders. To neglect our elderly parents is in God's sight as criminally and morally wrong as murder. It is serious. And the scribes and Pharisees would have understood the significance of what Jesus was saying perfectly. However, our text does move on. And we come on to the next part of chapter 7 about the Syrophoenician woman. Try and say that word quickly. I've had to do a bit of practice on this one. The Syrophoenician lady. I haven't got it up there, but it's in your text there. And, um, sorry, I've jumped the gun, haven't I? We're going to deal, first of all, with what defiles a person. I apologise for that. I'm getting too carried away because I want to get to the Syrophoenician lady. Verse 14. Jesus called the people to him and again said to him, Hear all of you and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And Jesus was wanting to make sure that the crowd understood the lessons of poisonous traditions. 
because the false authority of man-made tradition was so ingrained in the Jewish thinking and the Jewish culture, they struggled to accept God's truth outside of the framework of tradition. You say, what's it got to do with me? Well, here's the thing. Many of us Christians struggle to understand how we can exist outside of the framework of a denomination. There are people trapped in denominational thinking so much so that they cannot visualize their identity in Christ as faith in Christ outside of that religious structure. That's why when people come knocking on your door from the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witness, they are trying to get you to join the organization. You see, to them, the organization is everything, and there are lots of denominations and religions like that. So, Jesus comes to his closest disciples, and the 12 of them were with him, and they didn't understand the point he was saying. Look at verse 17 in Mark then. When he entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. Now, there was no parable. What Jesus has been saying to the Pharisees and scribes earlier was not a parable. That was literal, practical, in-your-face confrontation. But these disciples were so confused because of their conflict between tradition and culture and religion and Christianity, they just couldn't segment it in their thinking correctly. And so Jesus doesn't address their misunderstanding on the parable. He comes straight to give the next lesson to help them to grasp the real issues. So just pick up with me in verse 18. And Jesus said to them, Are you also without understanding? Do you not see that what goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and it's expelled? And by this he declared that all food is clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. And listen to this is the real crunch line here, verse 21. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. You need to take a big breath after that. All of these evils come from within and they defile a person. Now, that's not good news for our society. Because our society, our government, would look at that list and say, mm, nothing wrong with that. They would look at murder and say, well, well, murder of babies is okay. Murder of old people is okay, but there's in-between people we don't approve of. <laughs> the irony of a corrupt, morally bankrupt government. So we need to just pick up on a couple of things here before we move over. That's a fairly comprehensive list that Jesus says. Now you, you notice that he says you're not sinful because of you putting those things into your life. He says you do those things, sinful things because the sin lives within already. The sin bubbles up and expresses itself through these behaviours. Now just stop. I read through those reasonably quickly, and you probably wish in my mind that I'd bypass that verse, because I find that quite confronting. So God says, this is what sin is. If you want to be able to define sin as God defines sin, this is the good category list. It's just like a summary list. If you want to adjust your thinking to align your values with God's value, this is the list to start with. So it starts with thoughts. Did you see that there? Evil thoughts. Thoughts. To think, God thinks thoughts can be evil. Ha <laughs> ha! And don't we know it to be true? So what do evil thoughts do? They produce evil behaviour. Ah, oh, Jay, thinking, don't like this, because our society tells you 
what you see and what you hear and what you feel and what you think are disconnected from what you do. Now, look at how these evil thoughts express themselves. Sexual immorality. Now, in the Greek, the word sexual immorality there is a word that is used for all general forms of sexual sin, sexual wrong behavior. It includes adultery, includes fornication, that is sex outside of a marriage relationship. It includes living a de facto relationship, in other words, a pretend marriage relationship. It includes homosexuality, lesbianism. It even includes um, bestiality, sex with animals. It's just a general term for sexual immorality. And he says there, sex is wrong, sorry, evil thoughts are the cause of theft. You steal something, it's because you've got sin in your heart. And he goes on and says, murder, that's because of evil in your heart. And he comes back for the second time to this sexual thing. He says adultery. Now, there's a difference here. The word adultery here means purely unfaithfulness sexually in your marriage relationship. So now he's really nailing it. He says, you know, you may think there's all these sexual sins, that's one thing, but he says, in, in God's eyes, I want you to know, sexual unfaithfulness in marriage is worse because you are in a covenant relationship of the highest human relationship that God has created in mankind, and when you violate that sexually, you violate and prove that you are an evil person in your heart. What does that say about our nation? Where adultery is the expectation of many who get married. Coveting, that's looking at someone else and saying, Oh, I wish I had that. Now, that's not just looking at the nice new red Commodore that they don't build anymore and go, oh, I wish I had one of those. It's not that. It's looking at that lovely new blue Mazda the neighbours just bought and thinking, I'm going to get one of them. I don't know how I'm going to get it, but I'm going to get that car. The coveting is serious. It looks at what someone else has and says, I'm going to make that mine somehow, by hook or by crook. Wickedness, deceit. Now, here's the thing about deceit. Deceit is not just lying. Deceit is silence. Deceit is withholding truth. Deceit is manipulation of truth so that the other person doesn't think that what you're saying is that bad after all. Deceit is a government that says aborting babies is acceptable because of the mother's right. Why? What are they doing? They're trying to misrepresent the moral values of life by God by watering it all down and saying it's not really like that, it's like this. Deceit is manipulative, it's cunning, it's shrewd, it's selfish, it's painful and it's hurtful and deceit never brings good. And then he goes on to sensuality. He's back to the sexual thing again. This is now the third time in this one verse he talks about sexual sin as being an expression of an evil heart. And the Greek here word used here for sensuality basically means this in one word, filthiness. It's dirty sexual thoughts. It's perversion. It's the people who are filthy-minded, they turn all jokes into sexual jokes. They turn all sorts of humour, TV comedy, no matter what it is, somehow it always gets turned around to some sort of sexual connotation. They're not just happy with normal sexual relationships. They have to pervert and distort it and turn it into something impure and unclean and, and unattractive which God never intended the sexual relationship between one man and one woman to be. It was always intended to be an expression of God's holiness. And that's why sexual purity in marriage is so vitally important, because it expresses the very nature of God. Now, does it intrigue you, as it intrigued me, that in this one verse, the Holy Spirit is focused on sexual sins three times? Now, people, what does that tell you about humanity? We are a sexually perverted, unfaithful species. And there's no arguing that. The statistics are overwhelmingly against us. And Jesus publicly, even 2,000 years ago, he nails it. 
He exposes the sin for what it is. It is evil, he says, and it comes from the heart within. We do what we think. Behavior always betrays the heart. That's a rather self-condemning thing to say because I'm as guilty as everyone. What I do is what I genuinely believe. I can say what I want, but my behaviour will always show what is really in there. And that's what Jesus was trying to teach these people. Understand that your traditions are just an expression of the evil that lives in your heart that you are not willing to deal with. Well, there's some very probing challenges in that verse. And here's one of them. This verse, these three verses, sorry, 21, 22, and 23, they are a very good, healthy thermometer for you and I to use to measure the health of our heart. Now we all know you go to the doctor, when I was a kid he stuck a thermometer into you, under your tongue or under your arm or some other place. He wanted to know what was going on inside. Jesus gives us a list of external behaviours that he says categorically come from the heart. If you want to really know, if you want to honestly with integrity come to a point in your life where you know and you understand your own heart, look at your behaviour and say, God, now I understand what you see when you look in my heart. Now I understand that's not popular. I understand that that can be cutting and it's not my intention to be cutting. I I am saying this to myself as much as I am to you. We need, as people who claim to follow Jesus Christ, to have the integrity to say, God, take your word and use it as a thermometer in my life. I really want to know my true state of health. You don't go to a doctor and say to him, look, doc, I know I'm sick, but don't tell me I'm sick. You don't say to him, doctor, I don't want you to do any tests. I know I've got cancer, but don't tell me I've got cancer. We don't do that, do we? Obviously not. But that's what we do often when we come to God. We say, God, I know there's something terribly wrong in my life, but I don't really want you to tell me what it is. And that was the crowd that Jesus was speaking to here. They had all their religious traditions and ideas and thinking and what not rituals, but they didn't want to deal with the core heart issue of what was damaging their relationship with God, and that's the sins of the heart that was overflowing into their lifestyle. Well, we've quoted it many times, Jeremiah 17, 9, we know it. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately sick. But here's the worst part of that verse. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 79. I used to hate it when my mother quoted that to me. (laughs) Why? Because as a part of growing up, it came to a point where I had to accept that I don't even understand the sin that I am capable of myself. I don't even understand the amount of error I am capable of believing myself. I am so self-deceiving in my heart, as we all are, that your heart will not tell you that it is lying to you. Your heart will always bury error and lies in more lies. Here's the thing, people. Your heart will always, 100% of the time, tell you that your sin is okay. That your false beliefs in Jesus are okay. Your heart will always lead you down that pathway into self-isolation from the Almighty under the pretense that you're getting what you want. And it turns out at the bottom of that path is a place called hell. And you didn't actually want to go there, but you believed the lies of your own heart. 
It is tragic. It is alarming. And when the word of God speaks to this real heart probing issue, the world stands up and says, who are you to judge? Well, I'm not. I'm just, the judge who wrote the Bible is telling us the facts. It's up to us to rise and to use our choices to say, God, I'm willing to evaluate my life by your standards and your values. Well, now we get to the part I really wanted to get to, the Syrophoenician lady. I had to go and find the pronunciation website to, <laughs> to help me pronounce this right. The Syrophoenician lady is the next story in our text there, from verse 24 onwards. And Jesus arose from there from talking to these people, and he went to a region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered the house and did not want to know, um, want anyone to know. Yet he could not be hidden. He, he wanted just a break from the crowds. Now, uh, Tyre is about a hundred kilometres, getting it right, northwest of the Sea of Galilee. Now that's quite a journey. What's a hundred kilometres? It's a bit past Rotorua. So you have to think about yourself, how long would it take you to walk to just the other side of Rotorua? So that's what they did here. They went for a walk. They end up in this place called Tyre. And Tyre um, is just south, 50 kilometres south of the town called Sidon. And it's on the eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea. Sidon was a coastal town and it was a Gentile territory of Phoenicia. And that's why this lady is called a Syrophoenician, because she was a Phoenician. Well, there you go. Now, look at your text. There. Mark chapter 7, verse 25, tells us that soon after arriving, a Syrophoenician Gentile woman, who was the mother of a demon-possessed daughter, hunted Jesus down. She had somehow heard him, knew he was coming. And so she found him. Now, there is a good reason for Mark telling us about this lady, and it comes back to the three things I was telling you earlier on at the beginning to remember. From a first century Jewish perspective, remember Jesus was Jewish, his 12 disciples were Jewish. From their perspective, this lady with a demon-possessed daughter had everything going against her. And I do mean everything. She had nothing in her favour. Let me just highlight that. First, she was a woman. Now, Jewish men looked down on women as inferior possessions that they owned. That was it. It was a common practice of Jewish men when they said their morning prayers to first of all thank God that they were not born female. That's how ingrained the segregation was in their Jewish first century culture. Secondly, she was a Syrophoenician Gentile by birth. She was born in the, the country of Phoenicia, which was taken control of by Syria under a Roman general by the name of Pompey, and that happened in about uh, 65 BC. And the Jews hated the Phoenicians, who were Gentiles. Jews hate Gentiles. How much do they hate Gentiles? Jews considered a Gentile human being to be of lower value than a dog. You get the picture building up here? These 13 Jewish men arrive in a Gentile Phoenician town and this lady comes and talks to them. Matthew 15.22 says that this lady was a descendant of a Canaanite family. Now the Canaanites were ancient enemies of Israel and they were hated. There's a lot of hatred going on here. And that's the whole point. This is why Mark puts this detail in there. Now thirdly, as if that's not enough, this poor lady, she lived in, this, in the area of Tyre and Sidon. And Tyre and Sidon, uh, they worshipped the fertility goddess Astri. In other words, we would know this goddess uh, as the Old Testament terminology of Astroth. She was the god of fertility. Morally bankrupt goddess and bankrupt religion. Their, their idolatrous practices were just heinous, to say the least, including burning your babies, public orgies, all in the name of religious ceremony. That's the area this lady lived in. 
So, Mark tells us that Jesus interacted with this woman. Now, to a Jewish man, that was a no-no. You just do not do that, Jesus. The 12 disciples of Jesus would have been sitting there in absolute horror, thinking, what are you doing, Lord? You don't talk to this woman. The, the inner animosity would have been raging within the, th the 12 disciples. And so Jesus showed this lady and the 12 disciples and anyone who cared to watch on that he does not buy in to racial segregation. Ethnicity is of no value to him, of no importance. Verse 26 says that this lady begged Jesus to cast out the demons from her daughter. She meant business. She wasn't just she wasn't like the people in the crowd who came up and just touched the hem of his garment to get a healing. She was there begging. Now she was desperate on behalf of her daughter and most likely she had exhausted all the available exorcism options by her local idol priests and now she comes to the God-man Jesus. She obviously believed Jesus could deliver her daughter of the demon control because that's why she was there and that's why she asked him. And it would be fair to say that this lady would have been carrying more than her fair share of sins herself. Sins of wrong belief, sins of idol worshipping, paganism and all the evil rituals that went along with that. And here we find this woman now pleading with Jesus. In fact, Matthew 15, 22 tells us that she was crying to Jesus. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Now here's the thing. Number one point up there is the most significant. She knew who Jesus was. My friend today, do you truly know who Jesus is? Or you are relying on what your parents told you, what some church down the road told you, what I tell you even. Do you truly know for yourself who Jesus, the Son of God, the Christ sent from God, truly is? Does your understanding of Jesus impact your heart and therefore impact your living? Do you truly know who Jesus is as this lady did? You see, she acknowledged that Jesus was Lord. Not only that, she acknowledged that Jesus, she used his messianic title, the son of David, to Gentile peoples from Phoenicia just did not use that terminology. To them, their goddess, Asheroth, was their god. That goddess was their lord. Not Jesus. She was kicking against the system big time. She was out on a limb to say the least. She knew that Jesus was the divine source of mercy. Here's the thing. It took me a long time in my life to discover mercy outside of my parents' home. And yet I attended churches for years. Beloved, your Jesus is the wrong Jesus if he's not a God of mercy. The Jesus, the Son of God, who you find in the Bible is a God of mercy a God of compassion, a God of forgiveness, a God of second and 5,000 chances, if you want to use that sort of terminology. He is a forgiving God, but we must come to him in repentance. She knew this. She knew somehow, and I personally think it was purely through the Holy Spirit's ministry within her heart that somehow she had been discovered enough information of Jesus to learn who he really was. Now this would have been a shocking revelation for the disciples to witness. This pagan woman confessing Jesus' correct identity. Now verse Matthew 15, 23 adds that Jesus did not answer her a word and his disciples came and begged him saying, send her away for she's crying out after us. Get, get rid of her Lord, she's just a nuisance. And Jesus was testing the authenticity of her faith by silently listening. 
He didn't immediately respond because he wanted her to unload completely, to really, I'm going to use the word confess. Now here's the thing about confession. Confession is not for the benefit of God. Confession is for the benefit of you hearing what you truly think about Jesus and what you truly think about your sin. Confession, I mean, God, God, God knows it all anyway. You're not going to tell God anything he doesn't already know. But you need to hear what you really think. And as long as your heart stays locked away in silence, you will always protect your sin and your wrong beliefs about Jesus. But there's something about being called to publicly confess and you, you suddenly realize, hey, I, I, this is what I really think. And this is why it happened with this lady. Jesus gave her that opportunity. The, the disciples were just shocking in their response. Uh, their response to this poor woman was just dismissive. Get rid of her. She has an irritation. But that wasn't Jesus' response. She needed to hear herself confess. Jesus gave that opportunity, and in doing that, Jesus put the disciples to shame for their wrong treatment of this lady, for their lack of mercy. And so Matthew 15, 25 tells us that this lady was kneeling before Jesus and listening to this dialogue between Jesus and the disciples. Can you imagine it? She's in desperation, on her knees, crying, pleading for Jesus to, to help and to show mercy, and saying, you're the Lord, you're, you're God, you're the only one I come to because I know you have mercy, and the disciples are saying right in front of her, get rid of her, Lord, she's just a pain, get rid of her. That's a tense situation. And this Lord, this lady, interrupts the discussion between the wonky disciples and Jesus. And she says three words. Lord, help me. My friend, this morning you might be in your heart in the same situation. You are realizing that your heart is not what you thought it was. And your lifestyle is giving evidence that there is something in your heart that you, has been hidden from you for a long time. And you need to understand that Jesus is the God of mercy and you need his help. Because you cannot fix your heart. You cannot make right all the wrongs. Only God can forgive. Only God can reset. Only God can replace the deceived heart with a heart that is soft and pliable and submissive to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Well, it's at this point in the discussion that the conversation between this lady and Jesus goes a bit weird by our understanding. I want to draw your attention to that. And it's found in verse 27. If you have your Bible still open, just look at it. This is a real curly one. And Jesus said to her, so she's just asked for his help, and Jesus says, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And you think, well, that's a bit off centre. Where did that come from, Lord? What's that got to do with it? You see, by our way of thinking, it doesn't make sense, does it? It seems a bit left field. It's wacky. So let me read it um, again with a little bit of a paraphrase that's built from the context here and see if this helps you in your understanding. And Jesus' response says to her, Let the children, that's the Jews, be fed with the good news of the gospel first. For it is not right to take the children's, that's the Jews, bread of the good news and throw it to the Gentile dogs. That's the context. Because remember, Jesus is teaching his 12 disciples a very important lesson and he wants this woman to feel the application of the lesson. The lesson is Jesus came to the people of Israel first with the gospel and calling the repentance of the kingdom of God as hand. But that same message is always, without exception, extended to all nations, all Gentiles, because all Gentiles are non-Jewish. That was a shocking revelation to the disciples. They thought it was all about them. Remember earlier they'd been sent out in groups of twos to the people of Israel? And they stayed away from Gentiles. And now Jesus goes to this, 
what Jews would have thought as a cesspit area of idolatry. He allows this desperate woman who in the disciples' eyes was an evil creature to come and engage with Jesus. And this evil creature in their eyes says, you are the Lord. You are the supplier of mercy. You know me. And I ask you to help me. That's significant. And so, Jesus used their terminology in their cultural setting that would have got the lesson through. Now, the lady responds with a, a depth of understanding that Jesus, uh, about Jesus' earthly ministry that the disciples hadn't even grasped. Look at it if you've got your Bibles at verse 28. And she answered Jesus, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs, that's the Gentiles, under the table eat the children's, that's the Jews, crumbs, in other words, the crumbs of the gospel good news. In other words, even in your Jewish thinking, God lets the crumbs of the gospel good news drip down, fall down, so the Gentiles can eat them up and reap the benefits of the gospel good news the same as the Jews did. You've got to love the pictorial language use here. We think it's a bit skew with because we don't, understand, we don't talk like that, do we? But that's how they talked. Remember the, the essence of integrity in Bible study is this. It is not what that means to me. It is what that meant when it was written. It is a lethal poison, people, to open your Bible and say to God, what does that mean to me, Lord? What an insult to God. Open your Bible and say, God, what did you mean when you wrote that? And that's what I will believe. That's what I will obey. Well, I'm sure our time is gone, but I really want to just finish the text. <laughs> so, Matthew 15, 28 records Jesus' response. And he, he then says to her, Great is your faith. Be it to do, done to you as you desire. Mark 20, 7, 29 says, Jesus responded this way, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter, and she went home and found the child lying in bed, and the demon was gone. And we all say, praise God. What a wonderful miracle. You see, Jesus demonstrated that his mercy was always extended to Gentiles regardless. This nameless lady not only knew who Jesus was, she knew why Jesus had come. Her knowledge was the believing type of knowledge. She acted upon what she knew to be true of Jesus. Her faith in Jesus was not simply the sort of faith that was looking for a miracle for a daughter. Her faith believed because she genuinely believed in Jesus for who he was and why he had come. She believed so much more than even the disciples had at that point. She found Jesus, she engaged with Jesus at a level of faith that the disciples just had not experienced themselves yet. Amazing. And so, Jesus did a miracle at distance. And you know, when that woman went home and found her daughter delivered, what do you think that did to her faith? We don't read about it, but I tell you, she would have said to herself, I knew that was him. I knew he was God. Only God can do this. Anyway, we better finish our text before I put you to sleep. In Matthew 7, verse 31, they come to a deaf man. Now, just look at there, verse 31. Then he returned, Jesus returned from the region of Tyre, and he went up to Sidon, to the Sea of Galilee, to the region of the Decapolis. Now, to help you to understand that, in that one line verse, Jesus and his disciples walked 400 kilometres. They happened quickly. Only took about three seconds to read. Get the idea? They travelled a big circuit here. They'd been up and around and down, they came to the back to the Sea of Galilee, walked over the top of the Sea of Galilee down to the Decapolis area. Now you'll remember the Decapolis area from Mark chapter 5, verse 20. 
Remember the demon-possessed man? had 2,000 demons cast out of him and went into the pigs who drowned in the Sea of Galilee. That man went to Decapolis. There were 10 cities in that area and he was the first itinerant evangelist before even the disciples. That man prepared the population of that area for this event on this day. Jesus walks in there after walking 400 kilometers with his 12 disciples and the population knew how to respond and they said, bring your sick to Jesus. No need for advertising. They brought a deaf man. Because he was deaf, he was also um, dumb. He couldn't speak. Or as some verses will say, he had a severe speech impediment, which is understandable because he was deaf. And they they begged him to lay his hand on him. Now, Jesus did something rather unusual. Verse 33 tells you, Jesus took the man aside to a separate area away from the crowd and he put his fingers into his ears. And he, after spitting, he touched the man's tongue. Doesn't that seem peculiar to you? Can you just picture that? By our way of thinking, that's rather weird. Just plain weird. <laughs> you know, people watching the video thinking, well, I think you're weird, Fulong. And that's okay. The scene was weird by our way of thinking, and that's the whole intention of Jesus. So remember, Decapolis area, Gentile, pagan, they know nothing of God. All they know is that when this fellow called Jesus turns up in town, he will fix you. He will heal you. The deaf man comes, gets his ears poked at, gets his tongue wiped with Jesus' saliva-covered finger. And Jesus then doesn't look at the man. He looks up at heaven and he sighed. <sighs> That's what it would have been like. And he said, Jesus then says to the man, Epaphratha, which is, be opened. And his ears were open and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. So, because my time's gone... I'm going to wrap it up pretty quick. Why did Jesus do it this way? Well, Jesus wanted to non-verbally express his empathy and his grace to this man. Remember, the man's deaf. Talking to him is of no value. Is it? They didn't have sign language. They didn't have mobile phones. You know. How was Jesus going to really engage this man at a heart level to express the mercy of God in a way that this pagan, idol-worshipping, Gentile man would actually relate to? And so Jesus goes and pokes his fingers in his ears. He now knows what's going on. This guy's going to deal with my hearing problem. Jesus then touches his tongue. And he goes, well, he's also going to give the bonus of fixing my speech problem as well. We're on a good deal here, this man would have been thinking. And then Jesus looks to heaven. This is the bit that I would have got me. Having frequented a lot of doctors over the last three years, you get accustomed to a whole raft of responses. But I've never seen a doctor look up to the ceiling and sigh. What's the big deal with that? The big deal is that Jesus was empathising with him. He felt the man's pain. He felt the man's exasperation. And here's what more, he felt the man's desperation. I remember sitting in the office with my wife in Cambridge and a neurologist says to us, there is nothing wrong with you. It's all in your head. And I said, but I got hit on the head with a steel pipe. He said, it doesn't matter. It's all in your mind. You go and find a psychologist. And I sighed. Utter exasperation. Jo didn't sigh. She spoke a bit more directly to the man. <laughs> I sighed. In fact, if I hadn't pulled myself together, I would have slid in off the seat on the floor. I was so overwhelmed with disgust and desperation. We paid 500 bucks to hear that. Jesus sighed. Now the man would have understood perfectly why Jesus looked to heaven and went, <sighs> such is the mercy of our compassionate Saviour who is willing to sigh over your life and to relate 
to the desperation of your plight in life. However, it was the spoken word of Jesus that did the healing. When Jesus speaks, things happen. My friend, when you permit the word of God, the words of Jesus Christ to speak into your life, into your heart, things will happen. If you listen to this, if you read this and you go, oh, yeah, 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 but this is what I want, nothing will happen. You'll carry on the pathway of self-deception and blindness, leading you away from God and leading you to a dark, hot reception at the end of life. And that is not what Jesus wants for you. Open your minds, open your hearts, receive the truth of the word of God and say, Jesus, you do that work in my heart, in my life. Let's pray. Father, it's been a bit of a long walk through this passage today, Lord. But we thank you for the clearness of what we see in Jesus' life as he engaged with these different Gentile people. And Lord, we are so thankful that you are a lover of Gentiles. We thank you that you are a God of mercy. And we are here to give testimony that you have been merciful to us. You have been gracious to us. You have been compassionate with us. You identify with us. You understand us. You relate with us. And Lord, you are the only one who can replace our hard hearts with soft, compliant, obedient hearts of faith. Oh God, do that work in the heart of everyone here today. Strengthen us, mature us. Some of us, Lord, have no relationship with you. We pray that your Holy Spirit would bring the weight of conviction of the need for repentance and total surrender to the mastery of Jesus Christ. Oh, have your way for your pleasure and your glory in our lives today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.